Hey everyone, welcome to this video all about Azure Resource Graph. And really my goal for this is to walk through what it can do, the ways we will interact, but I'm not gonna try and cover the basics and the more advanced concepts of the language itself, because that's Kusto. There are many other resources on that. So my focus is, well, what is Resource Graph? How do we use it? And what are some of the interactions around the whole up Azure ecosystem that we can actually leverage? As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated. Now, I've talked about many, many times before, we think about Azure. And Azure is fundamentally this idea that we have this capacity. Now, that capacity is built up over regions that have network and storage, compute, and all those things. And then through that capacity, Azure offers various types of service. Now, the reality is those services are actually made up from these resource providers. So we have these resource providers. There's a compute resource provider that has VMs and VM scale sets and disk. There's network resource providers. And that interacts through all of those things. And then the way we actually do that interaction is kind of this Azure Resource Manager arm. And that has kind of this management.azure.com endpoint. And we essentially interact with ARM. And that goes kind of in both directions. Now we can use kind of um, REST APIs, we can use PowerShell, we can use kind of this CLI, uh, I can use Portal. All of these different things are interacting with ARM. Now I might be doing things, actually changing things, starting things, or maybe I'm just kind of querying for something. I want to get information. And I can absolutely do that. So through the Azure Resource Manager, I can query about what information is available in our subscription. Now at a very basic level, just kind of ARM on its own, there's a whole set of kind of metadata about things. For example, ARM has all this concept of, well, I can have tagging on various resources. And so just by querying ARM, it has a certain amount of data about the resources. So I can interact through that. If we jump over and look, just for kind of an example of this, I could say, okay, well, let's just get some basic information about all of my resources. So I can just kind of run that, okay? And if I just select the first three objects, well, we can see it knows certain things. On its own, well, it knows about, okay, the name of the resource, it knows about the resource group name, the resource type, uh, the location, and the resource ID. And also it knows the tags. So just by interacting with ARM, I can get that very, very basic detail. But then if I go and actually look at a particular resource, I get AZVM and format that. Now there's a huge amount of information here. But to get that information, what is now actually happening is, ARM now has to go and talk to the particular resource provider for that resource to get the additional information. So if I'm querying just very basic name and ID and tags, ARM kind of has that metadata available. If I go deeper into the resource, well now ARM will actually have to go and communicate with the various resource providers to get the additional data, maybe extended sets of information. And then you can imagine, well, ARM itself actually has various throttles in place. It takes a certain amount of time to actually get information back. And if I have a more complex query, well, I might have to talk to multiple resource providers, multiple types of resource. Imagine, I wanna find out about the virtual machine, its private IP and its public IP. Well, remember the way ARM works is they are all kind of distinct resources. Inside Azure, there's absolutely the idea of, yes, I have the VM. Then that VM links to an actual network interface object. That network interface object links to things like a public 
IP. So straight away, I kind of have these three different objects I would have to interact with. So if we go and look at the PowerShell to get what seems very basic information, well, sure, I can go and get the virtual machine I want, and I could just look at that kind of straight away. Okay, there's the VM. And we can see within that, well, there's like a VM ID, and there's a network profile, that there's various things it links to. And one of those is kind of the network interfaces. So, okay, I could go and get the NIC for that virtual machine. And then once I know the NIC ID for that VM, I could actually go and get the NIC object itself by getting the get AZ network interface. Well, that object itself has an IP configuration and it has a private IP. But then if it has a public IP, well, actually the public IP just links to another object of type public IP. So then I'd actually have to go and get the public IP object where the ID matches the ID in the IP configuration. And then I can kind of spit out that ultimate information, say, okay, your VM has a private IP and a public IP. But you saw we're kind of bouncing around three different objects, the VM object, the network interface object, and then ultimately the public IP object as well. And I can really think about, well, that, you saw each one of those took a certain amount of time because for each one of those, it's okay, it's talking to ARM, it's finding the right resource provider, getting that result. Then it does another query, okay, well now I need it about the network interface. Then another query, now I need it about the public IP. And each time, it took a certain amount of time. Imagine that now over hundreds of resources or maybe over hundreds of subscriptions are trying to get that data for. And it gets very, very complicated. And as I mentioned, ARM does have limits on how many queries I can run, how many read queries and how many write queries. Now, we can actually go and look at that. So if we jump over again, I can actually look at kind of the debug header and I can see, well, what is, if I clear the screen quick, if I do dash debug, I'll actually get all of the kind of HTTP headers. Then those HTTP headers all the way at the top, here we go, okay, so I've got the HTTP response. Within this HTTP response, we can actually see things around, let's just get this in, those details about my quota. So you can see here, I have this rate limit. So my rate limit remaining subscription reads is 11,980. So I basically get uh, 12,000 of these reads per hour. And I think it's 1,200 writes per hour. So there are actual limits on these things. I can't just do an unlimited number of interactions. I can also get the same information from doing a REST query. So here I'm just creating an authorization header based on my current context. And then I can just make a request to my subscription and I can actually look at that header and I can see, okay, for right now, just to another hour, I have 11,999 left. So there is a limit on how much I can actually interact with the Azure Resource Manager. Now, it's a huge number, but it, it's finite. And so depending on what I'm doing and how complex those queries are, that throttling may become a problem, but also just the time it takes to do anything can become a problem as well. So we have the Azure Resource Graph. Now, the Azure Resource Graph is actually a resource provider. So we have the idea that one of these resource providers is kind of this resource graph. And what the resource graph does is it basically has its own database of information about all of the objects in Azure through the Azure Resource Manager. And the way this works is every time I do something through the Azure Resource Manager, it actually notifies the resource graph. So, hey, there's been a change made well, that gets told to the resource graph, which obviously then updates its database. Additionally, periodically, the resource graph does a full scan in case something got missed. 
maybe there was some change outside the regular means to make sure its database is always up to date. Now with this, I can super efficiently sub second across hundreds of subscriptions query for information about my Azure resources. Now, when I do a query against this, again, I'm coming through the Azure Resource Manager, but now I'm targeting the resource graph, resource provider, as long as I have read permission, so I need read permission to the object, as long as I have read permissions on the identity and access management of the object, it will get returned in my results. If I do not have read permission, it won't get returned in my results. It just simply won't show, it won't say no access, it just won't get returned in those results. Now the Azure resource graph is free as well. Just like ARM therefore, there are throttling limits in place, but these throttling limits are more based around how many I can do kind of every five seconds. Um, and let me just show you that kind of throttling, because it's kind of an important thing to understand if we start using the resource graph in a big way in how we want to actually interact and send the queries. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna use the Azure resource graph and I'm firstly just gonna do a very simple query. Now straight away you'll see kind of my query here, it looks exactly like Kusto. So hey, the table and then my kind of query. And once again, I'm adding kind of that dash debug. So that will get me the various headers that it's using behind the scenes, the PowerShell is using the REST API. So now if I actually go and go through this, here we go. So what you're gonna see here is, hey look, quota remaining is 14 queries. It resets after five seconds. And likewise, just like I did with kind of the arm, I could do exactly the same thing through the REST API. If I call the REST API here, look at the headers, you see exactly the same thing. Now, because it's every five seconds and I took more than five seconds, I'm back to 14 for the next five seconds again. And I'd have obviously the same content as well. It's returning those actual results to me in JSON format. So the key point here is if I'm gonna use resource graph and I wanna do like a lot of interactions, don't try and send 60 queries in one go because you're gonna break the quota. What you'd wanna do is kind of send 15, wait five seconds, then send 15, wait five seconds. So you're gonna do it in batches. Now, there are ways you can actually contact Microsoft and get that quota extended. So there are things you can do but ideally, if you're just doing kind of regular interactions, just batch them kind of 15 at a time. And that should get you past any kind of throttling limits that are in place. So let's actually take a look at this. And really, a very easy way to interact is just by going and looking at the portal. So if I jump over to the portal, we can actually go and head over to the Resource Graph Explorer. So I can just type Resource Graph and you're gonna see Resource Graph Explorer. Now, straight away, you can see there's these tables on the left. Now, these tables are kind of the different namespaces where we have the various types of data. Now, remember, this is targeting the Microsoft.ResourceGraph resource provider. It's still using the management.azure.com endpoint. It's not some different endpoint. It's not some different authentication gonna use though that Kusto query language that we're used to with Log Analytics or Azure Data Explorer. I can do all the fun things I can do with those things. But we have all these tables. Now I could just click on one of them, like resources is a very common one, and run it. And then I'm gonna get this mass of all of the different resources I have available to me. Um, likewise, maybe a resource containers. These would be my subscriptions and my resource groups. And I can kind of run those things as well. So you can kind of play around and just start looking. And A, I can see the results down here of the kind of attributes that are available. But and I can kind of open these up. And I can see, okay, well, there's subscriptions in there. There's resource groups in there for a subscription. Okay, well, it has the state uh, authorization source 
Um, okay, spending limits. I can see the types of things that are actually going to be available to me and how I can interact with those. Now, if you're curious kind of about the full list of what all the tables are, they are documented. So you can see here the resource graph tables tells you, hey, um, resources, resource containers, you can go through and notice there's very interesting stuff here. Notice I can see things like, okay, well, advisor resources. So from the things from um, the Azure Advisor, I can get to that through resource graph. Um, maintenance information, um, data protection, security. So there's a lot of great information from here. Now, maybe a good place to kind of start is I showed you that kind of PowerShell. And we kind of saw how long it took to get that kind of private IP and the public IP as, as it kind of went through as I went to those different resources. I can get exactly the same information in the resource graph. So if I jump back over to here, what I can actually do is I've already created a query to do this. So I've got this VM IP information. Now this is using basically Kusto. Now you might look at this and say, well, that looks pretty scary as well. I'm accessing the same three types of resource. You can see, hey, I'm looking at the Microsoft Compute Resource Provider and virtual machines. I'm looking at the Microsoft.network network interfaces, and I'm looking at the Microsoft.network public IP addresses. And just like Kusto, what I can do is I can join on those different sets of data I get back. And you'll see things like outer and inner and left and right. It's really just about, well, do I want all records, um, a union, or only if it's on the left, I kind of my uh, outer. Do I only want it if it's on the inner, the right? All of those are just standard Kusto. But essentially, all I'm doing here is, hey, I want to get the virtual machine. And then I want to join that with the information about the network interfaces basically on the NIC ID on that far right there. You can see, OK, so the NIC ID I had from the VM properties will join it to the information about network interfaces on the NIC ID. It both has the same attribute name. I can also do joins on things like attribute value. I can get rid of things. So you see there's this kind of project away. So what happens is because the output of the network interfaces and the VMs both have an attribute called NIC ID, I'm matching on that, but the output will include both. And if there's a duplicate, it adds one to the second kind of instance. I don't want that to show up. So I'm projecting it away. I throw it in the trash can, don't care. And then I just select, well, I just want to kind of project out of this join the union of that information. I want the VM ID, the VM name, and then the private IP, which I got because, remember, the private IP is a property of the NIC. I can actually go and get that properties.privateIP address. But now I need the public IP address. Well, remember, the public IP is a property of the public IP address object. So I do grab that object, and then Hey, I go and look at all the public IP addresses, and this time I join on the public IP ID, and then I throw away the ID of the public IP addresses. I don't care about them. So it, it looks, because it's a, it's a very rich, powerful language, but if I just run it, you'll see I got the same output. And it basically took a second to run. If I run it again, this time it took 0.289 seconds to run. So I can get all that same information from a single interaction with the Azure Resource Graph. Now, again, don't super focus right now on the complexities of the query. That's just the Kusto query language. We are not focusing on that. I just wanted to show I can get exactly the same information through kind of this uh, same query. Now, while you're in here, if you actually go to the get started, and let's actually scroll up a little bit, there are a phenomenal number of example queries. Hey, open the query for count Azure resources. Let's just delete away that stuff. Let's just do that, open query. 
So count as your resources. Now it's just looking at resources and then summarize count. Okay, I have 145 resources. Count key vault, list resources sorted by name. Okay, order by name ascending. Count virtual machines by OS type. Show first five virtual machines. So there's a massive number of sample queries that secure score by subscription. So here we're looking at the security resources type and then getting extended properties and then projecting that information out. So here I can see, okay, based on my different subscriptions, what are the various scores I have? That same information I could go and see in kind of Azure Security Center and kind of that all up portal. So there's a massive information in here to just get started. And I, I would recommend going through these. Now also, if we actually open up, in the documentation for the Azure Resource Graph, well, it has quick starts. It has starter queries. Now these are gonna look very familiar. But again, I can look at this and see what they're doing. I can look at advanced queries. Oh, list virtual machines with their network interface and public IP. This is what I used as a starter and I just modified it to add the private IP as well. But it has all this fantastic information um, to actually go through. Now, I've created some of my own for things that I wanted to do. So this is in the GitHub repo. For example, here, I created one that looked at the Azure Advisor. And basically, I wanted to know where it was a recommendation for a virtual machine. So if we jump over again, I should run it over here. So we'll do resource graph again. And if I paste this in, so we can see, hey, look, I want to look at my advisor resources where it's a recommendation. That's kind of the important point. I want it to be where it's a cost category and I only want to know if it's a virtual machine. And then what I do is I basically project out various properties, um, the current SKU, the extended target SKU, and then I look at, well, what is the 95th percentile CPU use, memory use, and network use, and then tell me that stuff. So if I run that, it says, hey, look, currently you're running these VMs, uh, we recommend you use these VMs. So from the resource graph, I am just hooking in to that fantastic data. Now, one of the really nice things here for the, the virtual machines is they're adding more and more actually to this. So one of the things I can actually do now as well is, well, I'll show you two things. I had some virtual machines. I was trying to find a VM by the guest name. Now, ordinarily, that would actually be super difficult. But through the Azure Resource Graph, I can actually look at the OS profile computer name, and I can also look at the extended instance view computer name. So this is based on the guest OS name, not the VM name. So I was actually trying to find the VM. And normally, depending on how I create the VM, one of these two properties will have the guest OS name that's coming in kind of via the actual uh, VM guest extension. So what this would actually let me do, if I run this query, it will find the virtual machine only knowing the guest OS name. So this is phenomenally powerful. I had to do this for a customer, and the way I did it, super efficiently, this took me a quarter of a second. And this would actually work over hundreds of subscriptions. You try and do that with regular PowerShell um, iterating through the resources. It, it would be a nightmare. But the other thing I can do as well, look at this, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but I can also look at, for example, unused resources. So let's say, hey, I'm trying to find all my unused managed disks. Well, again, with the resource graph, this is super simple. I can just say, hey, show me where it's a compute disk and it's managed by nothing. Okay, there's all my managed disks that are not being used. I could then go and look into more details and maybe delete them and save myself some money. Same for public IP addresses. Okay, well, show me all of the public IP addresses where 
there's no IP configuration that it's linked to. Okay, here are my unused public IP addresses. So I can really get a lot of great information from this. The portal itself also uses the resource graph for a lot of things. If I search, it's using the resource graph. If I just go and look at basic information, so if I actually go and look at my virtual machines, see all this information? This is using resource graph. And I can click a button, open query. If I click that button, it's showing me the resource graph query it's using to get that data. And look, this is a pretty amazingly powerful query. It's huge. But I can run that, and in half a second, I can get the power state. So things like the power state is actually now projected through the resource graph as well. You can see all this, and so it's so easy to get great samples and hey, how should I do things? It is using resource graph behind the scenes. And I can see everything that's available to me. Hey, if I go and look at my uh, Kubernetes open query, run it. Okay, there's information about my Kubernetes clusters. All of those top level things, again, in addition to search, are using the resource graph. Now, when I'm actually creating these kind of queries, you, you may have noticed I did kind of open a query. So I can save them. So here's one, the VM power state. So this is why I'm using that extended instance view power state. And here in this subscription, hey, I have it running. Now I hit save. I can save it as a private query. I, it's just for me. Or I can save it as a shared query and at that point, I'm going to select a subscription to save it to, and it's going to publish it to this resource graph queries resource group. And then other people that have permission to it, well, they're going to be able to see it as well. And here, if I do open a query and change it to shared queries, we can see, hey, I've got this shared VM IP information available to me. If I go to resource graph queries, here I can actually manage all of those shared queries. I can select it. And here I can actually modify, I could modify it for one thing, but I can actually change the access control to say, well, who should actually be able to use that shared query? So I really do have a lot of power, not only of what I can do, but how I can kind of share and interact. Now, by default, it's just going to query across kind of here, all of the subscriptions. If I'm using the REST API, I can also set a query scope. And this is super useful. If you imagine in my kind of um, structure, maybe I have management groups, maybe I have a, a dev and a prod. What I could say is, well, I only want to see maybe my dev environment or just prod. So I can actually set a scope as part of the query to say, hey, uh, I only want to see this. Uh, I can also pass that if I'm um, kind of from a PowerShell that I, I can kind of set what that target scope is as well. So I can restrict it to a certain scope of the things I actually care about. So here it's showing, hey, look, I could set a query scope of, for example, a management group. Uh, I could set it, for example, at which subscription or subscriptions I want to be included as well. And it does allude to the fact that, remember, that there is a limit. It's, it's, it's 5,000 subscriptions by default it will return. After that, I can do things like paging. And actually, the documentation does talk about that. So it does talk about um, if I have a large data set, it tells about how many records will get sort of returned by default. And then it talks about how you can skip records, you can get paging on the records. So if you have really, really large sets of data, um, I may need to be doing that. So that's me sort of operating through the resource graph. And as I showed earlier, I can do this through PowerShell, through the CLI, and the documentation actually shows you, hey, doing it through .NET, through Go, through JavaScript, through Python. I really can call this from really anything I want. If I was to look at my sample code, <clears throat> 
I didn't even get into these. I've got examples about finding scale actions uh, in your cluster. So that's by looking at the resources. I use this to find out if a virtual machine scale set had scaled. And this was kind of super useful to be able to do that. But here, I can actually say, okay, well, if I just want to search, I can use this search AZ graph. Again, I use that with the dash debug. I won't do dash debug this time. We'll just run it. And that's how very simply I can hook in to the resource graph. So it's just returning those various objects where it's virtual machine. I only have one in this particular subscription. So it's just going to return that one object. Now, I could also do that kind of via that RESTful API, which I showed before to get those content. But what about if I have a really big, hideous query? Technically, I could put it all on one line. But what I can do is use something called a here string. So this is for PowerShell. And that lets me, if I do this kind of at double quote, and then start a new line, everything within this here string any formatting is completely ignored. Any quotes or double quotes, it ignores everything. So this is just basically one big variable at this point. It's this here string. So let's see if I can actually select the whole thing. A little bit of a big window. So this right here is going to get stored as query. And then I can just call that query. So if I run that, it's going to give me that same information. So it stored all of those lines as just one variable, one string, ignoring any formatting within it. If it was single quotes, double quotes, it would not matter. And then I just ran it, and it, it gave me those values out. That's really all I had to do. So I can very easily interact. Now, Kusto is the language. Like, I remember I, I posted about this once before, and someone said, well, how do I... I want to use native PowerShell. Well, native PowerShell is calling the resource graph, uh, Kusto query language. There's not some different language I'm using from PowerShell. I'm still using PowerShell. Now, what PowerShell will do is it actually returns it as a custom object. Things like the AZ CLI will return it as JSON. Um, if you want from the PowerShell, I could convert it to JSON. I'm using the native kind of convert to dash JSON uh, commandlets for that. So let's do a few other nice things with this. So I showed before, hey, look, I can kind of do the open query from the portal. Well, when I was in the portal, one of the other things you probably noticed was, let's just open a query again, VM power state, run the query. Notice, pin to dashboard. So there are a number of different dashboard parts that I can actually use. So if I hit pin to dashboard, I can select which dashboard. So now, there's my VM power state. It's just pinned as a resource graph query. If I actually jump over here, here's a, let's go to uh, browse all dashboards. I'll just do a different one. Um, from here, for example, I could select um, to add. So if I do edit, notice over here, I have all of these different things, resource graph single value, resource graph chart, resource graph grid. And I could just add these in. So if I did add, for example, there's that resource graph single value tile. Or I could kind of drag in a chart over here and hit save so you would just hit configure tile and it's giving me a default query and i can kind of run that and if i like that i can just do update pinned part on the dashboard so it will now set that part to use this query likewise for example you can see hey uh, i've got this configure tile over here so for this one, okay, well, that's doing the different types of resource I have, and I may like that. Or maybe I wanted to do something else. Maybe I do that VM by state, whatever I want. I would change the query, then update the pin part, and there it is.
So it's super easy to integrate the resource graph actually with everything I'm doing on my dashboards. If I'm using the dashboards and I've got some great resource graph data, fantastic, use it. So that's fundamentally what resource graph is all about. It's a super fast, efficient, across hundreds of subscriptions, way to get information about my objects, no matter kind of how many there are. It, generally, it's always going to return kind of sub-second because it has this separate database. And I talked about, well, hey, the ARM notifies when there are changes to the resource graph, so it updates its database, does that full scan. But another thing this does is it actually track, tracks the changes. And you may have seen there's this application change tracking feature that goes back 14 days. And it will show me any changes made to my environment. It's using this resource graph to do that. It's actually tracking it via the resource graph. So when I go to the portal and I say, OK, from within here, let's go and look at application change analysis. And this is powerful because now I can go and see well, what's changed. If things broke, what has changed in my environment? You can see, for example, it shows me, hey, look, at this time, there were some scale actions changed on my scale set. The SKU capacity changed. So it scaled originally up from 1 to 2, then it scaled down from 2 to 1. But this gives me the ability to really hone in and see, well, exactly what's happening. I can use the little blue pills to filter to particular resource groups. Um, I can change on important, normal. I could add other filters. I could add, for example, hey, um, particular resources. I could add particular resource types. Maybe I only care, let's drill down. I only care about scale sets. So I can trim that down to just show me what is it I actually care about in my environment. So I can kind of then go and see all those things. And I can hook into that as well from, for example, my PowerShell. So what I'm doing down here is I'm actually going to look at a certain storage account. So I'm setting my resource ID to be a certain storage account I have. I'm looking really just over a day. And I'm telling it, hey, fetch property changes. So I'm going to create that. Remember, I'm using a here string again. That's the JSON body of the RESTful API. And notice what I'm going to query against is just a regular Microsoft.Azure.com endpoint. But I'm asking the resource graph. And then I'm just going to send it that auth header I created before. It's not expired yet. It's not been an hour. And I'm sending it that body. And what I'm actually going to do in this is to make it look nice, because if I look at it on its own, it's kind of a mess. So I'm going to convert it from JSON, then back to JSON. Uh, by default, it does the depth of two, which means I'll lose data. So I'm going to just set it to a depth of 100. Well, this will make it look pretty. And what I can see now is, well, OK, my changes. I can see kind of the different snapshots of when changes occurred, the before, the after. And I can see what the actual changes were. So I can say, hey, look, the SKU before was standard LRS, after it was GRS. Um, a user changed it, and they updated it. And then I'll see other attributes, because now there'll be, for example, things like secondary region. There'll be other things happening. So I can use that resource graph for more than just, hey, you can see, secondary location was added as well, because now it's GRS. It's replicated. So the resource graph is phenomenal. Yes, uh, I can go and get information about everything in all of my resources. The portal is using it. I can now use it from my code. Remember, we do have those kind of throttles. So do batches, maybe 15 at a time. But other things are going to now hook into that. So I can actually go and see, well, what's changed in my environment? So if I see a problem occurred at a certain time, saying broke, hey, I could go and use this. Um, application change analysis, in that window, maybe an hour before or half hour before, what changed? And it will now give me that ability. So anything the resource graph knows, I can actually track and see the changes as well.
So that was it. I kind of just wanted to expose to what this Azure resource graph thing is. It's phenomenally powerful. Like I've changed a whole bunch of my processes that now I just go and query. Like there was the VM scale uh, action things. I now just use a resource graph to find out, hey, what scale activities have occurred? And then I, I can kind of act on those things. So I definitely would recommend go and look at this when I'm trying to find information about tons of samples. Again, the portal has that open query so I can see what it's doing behind the scenes to work it out. Um, but uh, go and have a play. Um, Documentation is fantastic. Going to need to learn Kusto, um, but learn it anyway. Log Analytics, Data Explorer, they're, they're all using this. And it, again, looks pretty big. But I'm just really, if you use SQL, Transact SQL, you select, hey, the attributes I want, then you might join across things. It's really the same concept. It looks big because I'm just, hey, I want to get these bits of data, and then, hey, if these things match across different tables, then I want to see these union attributes. That's really all it's doing. So I hope that was useful. Uh, until next time, take care.